start by uh, just to warm up a bit. Just, I'm really curious. Uh, I'm Jo Barker. I'm hosting this session today, and uh, I'm just wondering if we got any school teachers in the room. Again, again. Yeah. Mm, sorry. If we. Uh, it's just asking if anyone is a school teacher. Thank you. Who's a sort of works in schools person? Okay. Anybody got kids? <laughs> Great. Anyone still feel a bit like a kid? <laughs> yeah. It's just as well. Uh, <laughs> Anybody who anybody who feels like um, they would really like translation close by that doesn't have that people who English needs we need to talk slow for yeah. you. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Slow for you, okay. <laughs> and that ha that's then that's okay. Great. Yeah. For me, I'm going second. I tend to talk fast when I'm excited. So, go I don't know whose recorder this is. Just whose recorder is this? Um, this one. Don't know. There was another one here. There was two the other ones. You need to speak up and ask the people. Uh, hello. Is, oh, whose is this recorder? It's from the media recorder. Oh, is it, yeah. is it part of the uh, IPC then? Yeah. Okay. So there's a mix in the session. Okay. So does Thank that you. look this like it's going? Is that what you know? The sound tech guy was here about. Yeah. yeah. It's going. It's going. Good. All right, good morning everyone and welcome to the children and school session. I'm very personally excited to be here today and to present um, for the speakers. And before I do that, we've got a, sh a short announcement. Hello, hello. Hey, good morning. Hello. Good morning. Ah, okay. Hello. Uh, we just wait to know that uh, it's almost starting project, Children Drama Culture. So it's going through, through the EPT, so the European uh, Partnership for the Teachers. And it's going around how to, how to bring teaching or drama culture into the schools, in the normal school. So we are it's a three years program from Erasmus schools and it will be a workshop on the conversation. Great. Okay. And it's starting on the, on the, you can see details on the Facebook uh, CIP project. Children in schools. Fantastic. Are you going to be in this session? Mm -hmm. So you're, you can talk with the people afterwards. <laughs> and another quick announcement, Charlie McGee, who you all watched last night as formidable sound system, vegetable sound system, really wanted to come here, but he's doing a workshop at the same time. He's working on a kid's um, CD, so I said that I'd let you all know about that. And one more week of the fundraiser online <coughs> to do that for him. So. It's Alan. Okay, so we're starting a few minutes late. Um, we'll probably finish in five minutes late at lunchtime as the whole day's going. 
So, school, children and schools. How can we support children to design the world they want? This is about designing our global education system using parent principles. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Robin Playfield. I met Robin about 19 years ago. I did her course teaching permaculture geography, and I believe she's going to introduce uh, the, the modern version of this. The evolution. The evolution. <laughs> um, uh, I also went to visit her at Crystal Waters in Australia when I went there, maybe once, which was a stunning experience for me to, to visit. Uh, Robin Clayfield is from Australia, is a permaculture and social permaculture pioneer, an internationally acclaimed facilitator, educator, author and social change practitioner. She spent 23 years of developing her leading edge dynamic groups methodology, giving her confidence to suggest global change is possible through creative, empowering, permaculture, education and group work. She's written lots of books and made loads of resources, um, which you can read about on the ITC website. Um, and also you've got a stall downstairs yep. in, in the little room that not many people yep. have discovered yet, it's so a, come find me. It's a lovely stall and you can get a wonderful attention from Robin. Um, this is an introduction to dynamics groups, dynamic learning, a heart-centred permaculture inspired methodology for effective learning and group work. Mm. Robin, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Hi everyone, yeah, it's a real pleasure for me to be here and to share my life's work with you. Like Jeff Lawton, I did my permaculture design course in 1983, so it's been my life work and my heart work for many, many years. I've taken it a very different direction to some people after they've done their permaculture course. I was encouraged to teach permaculture quite early in those days, in the late 80s, I started teaching permaculture design courses and I realised quite quickly that I didn't feel comfortable being the expert and everyone being the student. And I feel, I'll declare right up, I feel really uncomfortable in this room, being up here and you all sitting in rows. I virtually never work in rows, in a circle. So I'd like you all to just stand up and join me standing up here. <laughs> I'm a bit over all the talk. Um, it's my way to help people be much more interactive in the space. So just say hello to someone behind you that you don't know yet. Anyone who's coming to the convergence, I'm doing a whole hour workshop on creative facilitation. And um, I've been asked um, and put in the stream of children and schools, which um, this probably fits more appropriately in the whole education stream as part of the conference. But I'll do my best for all of you that are school teachers to keep this some focus on children. Because what I've done over um, 23 years of training permaculture teachers and since some um, Sky and I wrote the Manual for Teaching Permaculture Creatively and published that 20 years ago and it's in 65 or more countries around the world and um, I feel so um, excited that this has supported permaculture to be presented in a much more creative, interactive way rather than just lecturing and having to, personally I have to give myself lots of ear massages if I'm just li listening to someone speak all the time. So what I'll do my best to in this 20 minutes is do a couple of little interactive or energising things so that you're not in that kind of situation for the whole 20 minutes. And I'll also introduce you to my learning methodology that's grown out of those 23 years of training teachers and 25 years of teaching permaculture more creatively. Because what I've found is um, I've had almost 100% successful feedback from doing hundreds of courses, either one or two weeks courses and I knew why that worked, I knew it inside of me but I'd just be 
answering people's questions about, this is fantastic what you do. How come it's so successful? And I go, well, it's because of this and this and this. I kind of name it on my fingers. And one year I was doing a training course for a group of community development workers. They weren't um, connected to permaculture. Um, but they really wanted me to write it down, what worked. And on the plane flying home, I made a jigsaw puzzle, just on a piece of paper. It felt like a jigsaw puzzle. All of the pieces that we can put together to be really effective teachers and facilitators of other people's learning. Teachers in schools with children, um, adult education teachers and trainers, and facilitators of groups everywhere. And I so applauded Rob Hopkins there today because that deepening of our work, bringing heart-centred practices into our own training and education and our principles and working together for change. For me, my life's work has become helping facilitators, group leaders, teachers and all our groups work more effectively at what they do. This then we create change really fast, exponentially, if our groups and our, our courses and our schools are all on purpose, on task. We're not having to sort the conflicts and the problems and the side issues. We're more able to work for change. So that's kind of where I come from. And the methodology that I wrote down, that jigsaw puzzle, a friend of mine, Wendy Marchman, who's here at the conference, she helped me about five years ago, cut that jigsaw puzzle up, put together the pieces that were similar, and we threw it up in the air, and a magician came down, this magic jigsaw puzzle, which has now evolved into this beautiful elfy creature up here on the wall only three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So it's evolving and getting more flesh on the bones of this magician that carries the methodology. So really quickly I want to use what I call the sticky carpet process. I kind of made this up because I really, the constant power and po PowerPoint and talk, which used to be slide and talk, which used to be chalk and talk before that, this subverts it just a little bit. Um, it's still not hugely interactive because I'm not getting you all involved in this, I'm just presenting to you, but at least I can use a more colourful, creative way of presenting that to you that hopefully is more engaging. And I suggest any of the things I show you today, you could use that in schools with kids or with adult education or anything like that. And so the pieces to the puzzle of really effective, successful learning, for me, start here, in our feet. So as we go through this, I want you to imagine that you're a magician, that you totally can create magic with your school groups, with your adult learning courses, with permaculture, or whatever you're presenting or training all around the world. And so this, this first part of the magician, the grounding, is in ethics and principles. And so think about what ethics and principles you use when you're um, teaching at school or whether you're leading a group or facilitating. And any of you that haven't done any of that and are here because you'd like to, think about the situations where you've been in groups or in a class or when you were at school. Think about what ethics and principles were alive in the room. Yeah, can anyone think of anyone? Throw a couple out. Compassion, yeah, that's like a value, so we can bring all our values in here. Um, Valuing diversity, thank you. What about duty of care for everyone? In Australia, that's part of our cultural language, having a duty of care. And what about why we're all here? Permaculture, hey? We can weave our permaculture principles and ethics into any group, any class. And not just by making gardens with kids at school or um, you know, teaching permaculture design courses and learning the principles that way. We can look at our classes and our groups and apply the principles of permaculture socially. We can look at how do we use the principle of, you know, um, pick a principle, someone pick a principle. Fun. Fun, yeah. Edge. 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 Yeah, edge. So let's think about edge in a classroom. How do we expand the edge in a classroom or a group situation? The diversity that you just mentioned, that would be one of the things of expanding the edge. Um, opening the door, <laughs> like just to be able to you know, expand out into breakout spaces and other rooms, go outside, be under a tree, that kind of thing. So that's just one really quick example of using permaculture principles and ethics and applying it to groups and courses and classes, yeah?
So I'll just be whizzing through these. Um, the other part of the grounding of the magician is in shared goals, group agreements, having shared visions and things like that. And when we have that, we can move forward together. And think about in a school, kids kind of just turn up. They come because in most cultures, they have to. They don't have much choice. They turn up. They don't even agree to be there necessarily. Um, they don't work with the teacher to come to a shared uh, way forward together. You know, if we could bring that into schools, imagine how different it would be if the kids get to say, yes, I want to learn this and I want to learn that. Um, and, and the teacher supports the children to do that. And in some situations that does happen, in some learning methodologies or ways of education. Um, and even in like our permaculture design courses, how many of you have done a PDC? Yeah. Yeah. Did you get to choose your curriculum or did you just walk in and somebody went through it in a kind of linear way? Did anyone get to do needs-based permaculture course and say, we want to do this? Yeah, Emma. Yeah, Joe. Couple. Um, in the 30 PDCs that Sky and I or Jenny Allen and I taught um, in Australia and in some other countries, we did needs-based learning the whole time. The group, and we were doing this 25 years ago, the group got to ask us what they wanted to learn and then we found a way to go through the process. And we did it in creative, interactive learning ways. And that's why we wrote the <coughs> manual, because people said, how do you do that? And are you covering the curricula? <laughs> and we always did, every time, because people had the common sense that is aligned with permaculture. Or they realised they wanted to know more about it and so we'd cover it. And by the end, we'd always covered it, every single time and people have much more empowerment um, for their learning if they get to choose what they want to learn. So the next bit of the magician is the coloured pants of empowerment. So let's imagine, stand up and imagine that you've got um, really good ethics and principles in your um, right foot and that's grounding you in that and that you can take that into your courses and your groups and your learning situations. Imagine that in your left foot you've got the ability to help your group set group agreements and shared goals and shared visions together. Yeah, so you're grounded in that. Let's imagine that you're putting on the pants of empowerment. Yeah. Can anyone think what would, and you can sit down with those pants on now. <laughs> Thank you. Have, have a think about um, what helps you feel empower, empowered as a group or as a student. Imagine if you're a school teacher, your students um, your, the kids in your class, what would help you be more empowered? Any ideas? Ownership. Ownership, yes. What was that one? Joy. 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 Yeah. Affirmation. Affirmation. Having a really positive learning self-image, feeling good about yourself, um, being supported by your teacher. Uh, encouraging them to share <coughs> their stories. Yeah. Their yeah. Anything that helps come back to self and be really positive as a as a learner. And um, I've just I'm writing another book at the moment, and it's actually five books, and it's writing all of this down and giving a huge toolbox of processes. And this chapter is about 50 pages long, so <laughs> it's quite big. So quickly moving on, this um this part of the magician is about creativity, really helping our groups uh, like. Children in schools in the younger years, they use colour, they use all kinds of things. Um, and these puppets are quite colourful, you know. Kids in schools are exposed to this kind of stuff when they're young, but there's a point where this stops being part of education. Singing and big coloured crayons and pens and, you know, huge chalk drawings and sand pits, all of that disappears at a certain age. So I advocate for bringing it back, not just for kids in schools, but for adults as well. I encourage people to do both whole brain learning. Does anyone know cross crawling? Really quick one that you can, this is sort of, I won't get you standing up, so, um, but this is really simple cross crawling that helps us be whole brain learners. Not just rational, logical thinking, but switches on the creative, intuitive side of our brain. You can quickly do this sitting down just crossing from your nose to your ear. Just try that for a moment. It might seem a bit silly. 
but this will help wake you up. If you're sitting in, in there at any of the keynotes and you're going to sleep, just do this. <laughs> or give yourself an ear massage. It really switches on your hearing. It's a bit more, it's called brain gym if anyone wants to follow that up. But the whole idea of switching on our creativity. Um, Amber de Bono processes, I do lots of those. I've made up all kinds of creative processes myself that help teachers with kids in schools, but also adult learning. Um, the toolbox brings in all kinds of different creative processes, some of which I've got as a bit of a wild card set to go, oh, you're going to teach soils in a week and you're really bored with it. Maybe I'm not going to use the same process. Which one would you like to teach soils with today? Maybe you pull out puppetry. So it's like, oh, I'm going to teach soils using puppets. How will I do that? but it gets much more creativity happening, much more engagement. Using instruments and music and dance and movement with adults as well as children. Um, using things like Edward de Bono's Six Thinking Hats. Has anyone ever used them? No. Yeah, more often school teachers in schools have been exposed to the Six Thinking Hats. But making your own sets, getting more colourful with that. This side of the magician is for interactive learning and interaction so for me one of the key ways to do that is have all the chairs in the circle where everyone can see each other you're looking at some, the back of somebody's head um, being able to take input from every single person brings so much more to the space than what I could ever do pretending to be the expert up the front so um, yeah there's a lot to that um, the magician's head represents the art and skill of facilitation, also the attitudes of the facilitator, and being really well prepared. It's quite common sense. Anyone who's a school teacher knows this really well. You've got to be well prepared. And if a session is flowing, they're prepared really well. Yeah. And there's so much that could be said about this, being able to be on our toes. When we work creatively and interactively with the group, we don't just follow some linear plan or program really what we're able to do is be responsive to the needs of the group and the group energy and be able to throw the plan out the window for the moment and go with whatever the group needs. So I find when all the pieces of the magician, all the jigsaw puzzle is put together, people are really motivated. They're not just doing something because they feel like they have to or they're being taught to. They're really, really motivated. They're engaged. They're having fun. So they're more relaxed as a learner. Learning happens easily and um, people will remember it much better. So they take it out in the world with much more energy and inspiration. And so the magic wand comes out and we all become magicians. So just imagine yourself that you've got these tools. You know, you maybe just got a hint of it if you're just starting out. But come have a chat to me on my little stall there or come to my workshop at the Convergence and we can share more about this. It's my life's work and the toolbox that I have in my head and on paper <coughs> is huge. So um, I'd love to share more of that with you. A lot of you have tools that you've got in your toolbox. I encourage you to share them with the world. And the more creative and interactive you make that, the more magical the experience for all our kids, all, all our adults and all our groups. Yay, thanks. <laughs>
they're with a friend and their friend's taking them to their land and they go to design the place for their friend. So take them through the vision journey, now you're sitting on the land. What do you need to do to design this piece of land? You've got a magical notebook and you know you look around, you sit in a quiet place, you talk to the neighbours, that brings in the social design and social permaculture and more regional, brings all the social stuff in know what animals might you want to keep on the land. So I suggest a few things. People come back, brainstorm on the wall, which we would categorise into a, just a few similar themes, like site specific, general and more people systems. And then we get the group to suggest which ones fitted together and give that a name. So we have topics and we'd say, what order would you like to start in? <laughs> and most groups would want to go with topography and aspect and you know, soils and that kind of stuff. Um, one group wanted to start, they went, we don't care, it's all interconnected anyway. Let's do it alphabetically. So we started, <laughs> was mad. We started with animals, then we did building design, and then we did community. And <laughs> an interesting way in. And surprisingly enough, quite a few groups have wanted to start with more spirit care deeper um, you know, connection to the earth and to nature and start in that place. And that, that's really where I come from too, but I have to see that reflection in a group come to me, which is why my brand new principles card game that I've just developed the day before I came pretty much, um, I've woven um, that fourth ethic of permaculture in spirit care or the spirit of our groups, that kind of thing. So that's how we've done that. And we could respond to that more deeper need, the need that Rob Hopkins made a call for there as well, by asking the group what they wanted to learn. We would miss that stuff in the PDC if it wasn't coming from the group. Great question, thank, thank you. you. How are, and this is not much about developing and tackling social issues like all these, and integrating that with formal education like social science or job starting a project that's just curious about the problem. The problem oh, solving. Can we just repeat the question? So, What's looking the question? at like with formal curriculum of like say science, geography, painting, teaching permaculture through formal curriculum, maybe you want to think, yeah. Is there um, any ideas or thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I do tours of Crystal Waters Permaculture Eco Village where I live in um, South East Queensland and I often have geography students, uh, Year 12 geography students come for a tour. So I get to see how their senior high school teachers work with them and often and it's on projects that they take a tour, they walk around, they have to think for themselves and research. But I like to bring in all the creative tools that I've got can be used in schools. Big, large-scale sand pits um, that people gather around. Graham Brookman, who's here, I don't know that he's in the room, but he's got a stall downstairs. He's made a purpose-built sand pit at his farm that him and Anna Marie have at the Food Forest near Adelaide. And their whole PDCs, and you could do this in a school, get all the kids around, the senior kids, they might think it's a bit strange to start, start with, but around a big sand pit, teaching aspect and contour and um, design, zonal design. You can teach a whole project <laughs> course around a sand pit, just about, or broad scale chalk drawings in the middle of the room, or using clay and clay models. You know, start bringing our classrooms into a circle where we're all focused on something in the middle of the room. Next one question. idea. Next question. Oh, um, I work with thousands of um, not only children and all the other things. One of the things I've noticed in my recent um, adult life communities um, how do I, their aspirations, some of them uh, want to be reality TV stars. And one of the girls I've recently been working with was saving up a teenager, um, but she wanted to save up for a £5,000 handbag. Yeah. Um, and it's like, how. I get that I've got um, two children who have grown up and my grandkids are like 
10 and 6 now and there on the edge of going through that whole thing. Also work with youth a little bit, not a lot. And I found that the best thing to do is go with the energy of that and subvert the dominant paradigm. That's one of us that. <laughs> It, that's a statement that comes out of Nimbin in Australia, subvert the dominant paradigm. Um, I do my best to do that in all kinds of situations. And um, with the youth, I would, go, I would go to that woman's handbag. I'd suggest, her, suggest that you imagine like she's already got that and um, what's in the handbag that that handbag represents. Smaller than one possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then maybe have another hand, handbag that's like a toolbox for positive change and have a look at what's in there and what's in there and support her to make the distinction between the two and what supports life and what doesn't. Yeah? Uh, I really love teaching. I love what you're talking about. Wondering if you can speak a little bit to the transparency and empowerment um, and like how to facilitate this. Similar to what you're saying, we're in a culture of sit and listen and it can often be challenging to people in yeah. constantly um, subverting the dominant paradigm constant that's why in this room such a small space such a small time frame to get you into a circle and back I've got into trouble for that in the past at big festivals working with hundreds of people in a greenhouse venue at Woodford Folk Festival where I got into trouble because I didn't get the chairs back quick enough kind of thing, but I'm constantly finding ways to invite people to be in a circle or in small groups. At, you know, it's the most simple process, but to bring people into small groups where they can find their own solution. When people can speak and do things together, they have a 90% retention rate of things. So it's, you know, that's the kind of thing I aim for, for people to be able to talk together. Less of me, more of you. More and more and more. And I, I'm not shy anymore of jumping off a stage. What Pandora did there, I do that all the time. And I'll physically jump off a stage and join people and say, OK, let's drop out all your distractions or anything you're not liking at the moment, whatever, into your chair. And now let's put the chair aside and all come into a circle together. In schools, we can do that in schools too. Oh, I've got time for one more question. Um, it's quite practical. What do you do when you... Um Assignments and not all the kids like it. You're yourself. What do you do when you set an assignment and not all the kids like it? What I'd suggest, and some of the experienced teachers in this room may do this already, but working with them, um, well, working with the multiple intelligences. How many people know Gardner's multiple intelligences? A few people in the room. So imagine that you set assignments that aren't just for one intelligence, but have several different intelligences. And then working through the Bloom's taxonomy of levels of thinking, where you have um, them along one axis and your know, multiple intelligences along the other, and all the grid is full of different activities. So the kids aren't, oh, Virginia. Um, Virginia's an expert at this. I could anyone who's interested in the example. Yeah. So um, just to quickly answer your question there, to link you up with Virginia from Melbourne, and she's done um, permaculture in schools at Eltham College in Victoria with Year 9 students really successfully for years. But yeah, to, to give multiple activities and assignments so the kids can pick where their, their interest is and where their intelligence is. Wow, that's amazing in, in such short amount of time, that amount of information. Thank you so much, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So we're gonna, we've got a bit of a changeover now. Um, Paul's just going to do the IT. Um, so um, thanks so much, and I totally invite you to go and uh, visit Robin's stall, and my things are on the periphery of that. Um, down in the... The second little room <laughs> at the um, very end of the round room. Okay. Should you shoot yourself? Cut it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so this is Rovina. I almost got to the beach met Rovina in New Zealand. I did talk to you on the phone. Uh, I went to visit her community, Tui, in New Zealand on my eco village quest many years ago. Um, Rovina right. comes from New Zealand. She's a dynamic participatory outcomes best educator. 
Over the past 30 years, she's worked nationally and globally as a community development facilitator, organic growing tutor, documentary producer, and permaculture educator designer, focusing on schools, urban neighbourhoods, farms, eco-villages, and bioregions. I think that comes almost everything. She, pub- <laughs> she has published educational resources for developing sustainable <coughs> communities with a practical grounding in permaculture. She's the founder of Earth Care Education. How do you say that? Thank you. Um, and lots of other things which you can find out about on the IPC website. She will share her met- methodology now for establishing the seed, schools, environmental education and development, a progressive, unique blend of permaculture, traditional culture and PRA, participatory, rural, rapid appraisal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for showing up. I just want to show you a techie thing. When we get to this, you're going to press this arrow there yeah. and then that backwards and forwards. I won't press it right now. Okay, cool. So, um, in this uh, half hour, I'm going to break it into these components. We're going to start with an overview of C. What is C? Um, We're going to then look at the methodology that SEED uses and also are used in the work in other schools around the world, and that's influence in Viro schools in New Zealand. It's worth looking on their website. It's a really, it's a permaculture informed whole rollout across the country of, um, yeah, practical and in the classroom environmental education and borrow schools it's called. Actually I'm really interested in describing you've got your sticky carpet. Yeah, you can take it down with Yeah, okay, yeah, fine. Can. So here and now we won't scrub it. Maybe if you could scribe for me Joe as yeah, well. Sure. Um, as well as that, after the PowerPoint I'm going to talk about the transference, how you basically exit yourself as a initiator and have other people trained up to take something forward and multiply it across the nation. So um, why this title, um, which is uh, Permaculture Your Schools and Transform Your Town? I consider, and it's my observation and experience, that a school is a hub of a wider community. And geographically placed, there's schools throughout cities and rural areas where a population base will gather around that school there, another one around that school, And in my observation of community development, a school is the most vibrant, vital part of that community. So it becomes the stacking effects um, as we work in permaculture with stacking. We stack functions around that school, and the school is a community hub, and it's um, the title of one of the documentaries, Schools as Community Food Hubs, that's going to be launched um, at quarter six tonight. Okay, so starting with, I think I might as well just go to the PowerPoint and I want these five minutes. It's really important. Okay, next. So I'm going to start with the methodology and then go to C. Okay, this is um, out of the work of uh, Pelham, who's going to be ecological land use management that I work with in southern Africa to start with values, vision, and mission in a school. And I work with a technology called Holistic Goal Setting Mandala that came from Alan Savory's work. And in my book downstairs on Robin's desk, there is about how to use that mandala. But we get parents <coughs> in one group, students in another, and teachers in another, and we get, what is your vision for your school? What are your needs? in terms of the grounds, um, what about the practical things. And in C, we work with three components, or four actually. One is community engagement. The next one is environmental education. The next one, which is a missing part of most of our work in schools and permaculture, I think, is cultural enrichment, culture. So the culture, the songs, the stories, the dances, the poems, all that traditional and contemporary, then that's 50% or at least a third of the permaculture work in schools and it underpins all of the practical work and all of the academic learning. Um, so we're on those themes. Yeah, wait, yeah, yeah, let's go. Next. <laughs> okay. So um, the first thing is what are the needs of the school and which is in South Africa, I worked in the Goddess Head on the south side of Cape Town and this is school called Bongaleta. They wanted flowers. I said, what? These kids are coming to school. 
savvy. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't say it, but as a consultant uh, educator, I kept it to myself and I observed and I understood then later as about soul nourishment. So, oh, I can't go into stories. But anyhow, this is the driveway into the school, the Wolfhound School, and from a sandy desert gray. Uh, it became colourful and flowerful, flowerful, and now it's an arboretum for the whole area. Next. Yeah. The other one is a wafro, it's a Maori word, or an entrance way where people, there's work called Elements as Signifiers. It's the one of the most significant educational works I've ever come across. Learning through landscapes. I think we need to be striving our learning through landscapes. Um, which is a, um, a UK charity organisation that works in schools and they have a body of uh, resources, one that's called the Hidden Curriculum of School Grounds, Elements and Signifiers. What it means is the child steps into a space and they're looking to identify, do I belong here? What tells me that I'm loved and cared for? Is this my place? And this is a waharo entrance we're into our gardens at the school, which tells Māori students, this is your place. That's good enough to say things. Um, culture is a key component. I talked about this. This is a celebration, Matariki. It's a Māori new, new Year in New Zealand, and we totally celebrate it. And the food that happens, comes out of the gardens, is part of that hāngi of earth oven and becomes part of the feast for Matariki next. Um, so this is the hāngi, the earth oven. Next, what goes into that earth oven is the food that the children are growing in the grounds. These children, um, this is the rewai or Māori potato, and these children are kaitiaki or caretakers of this particular species or variety um, of rewai. <coughs> and they um, select what's the seed for the next year's planting, what goes home for children, plant in their gardens and what goes into the hangi and adults come to the kids after they've tasted that and they get seed for their own next. So my, one of my key aims in schools is seed banks in every school. Seed banks for the bioregion as a political act as well as it's a safeguarding our genetic diversity in the hands of kids. So children as kaitiaki or caretakers in the Maori language of the seeds in our, bio, in our community. Next. The other one is children as kaitiaki of fruit trees. Um, so fruit trees in school grounds, fruit trees in the streets around. Children researching, representing a tree, their favourite fruit, and they actually, in a forest garden lesson, um, or series of lessons, they are the ones that place that in the food forest, <coughs> in the new food forest. Next. Um, Part of that is open orchards, so here we are going outside of the school planting trees in the walkway, an older children, a younger child, and the youngest child three, so as one child leaves the school, that one coming up is able to watch and observe and tend and harvest, and the other one, they're at secondary school, they're an adult who can come back and say, well, I planted that tree, and ownership, next. Um, an educational orchard, not just a fruit forest, but actually a orchard for others to come through from the community to learn from that labelled trees, donated trees, heirloom trees for that area. Next. Um, and products from that orchard. So products from that orchard as a, um, a fundraiser for the school, as an identity for the school. The school grows great olives and they make multiple products. You'll see if you come to the documentary launch, you'll see the school in there. Next. Um, ronga, ronga, rongoa, sorry, rongoa, um, the Māori word for medicinal plants, and um, rongoa is the school grounds, a native plant trail through the school on the edge of the school, so people walking along the footpath can learn, as well as kids come in and through the school, weeds through the school, label plants, how to prepare them, how to use them, so they don't depend on the chemical medicines. Next. Um, native and medicinal plant borders <coughs> around the boundaries. This is the seed program in South Africa that I was the mama of and the initiator of, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. But one of their, they've got stages of um, permaculture rollout in the school grounds, and one of the first stages is planting the borders with me native medicinal plants, pest management plants. Next. Um, strategic positioning of your gardens. If you can open your gates and have it as a thoroughfare, if there's community engagement and belonging, that's the key thing, 
then um, you can have a community your school as a community garden. And more schools in New Zealand are combining school garden and community garden together. Um, next. Uh, next. Yeah. So how to do this? So we would do a community engagement process on many of them, and you know, I'm not trying to tell here. But in the, after that, we lay out um, with the signages and people do a virtual tour and that's when we adjust. So this is all of the things that came out of the community engagement process and people can imagine themselves um, next walking through the school grounds in the garden. So community garden within the school, I talked about that. We have <coughs> these refugees and we also have um, plants next for them that they can identify with from their culture. So gardens within the school grounds and you can see here the playing field. This is a relative location thing. It's um, small and slow solutions start um, intensive and work out next. Um, Mandala Garden. So, um, what is the most um, energy efficient uh, stacked garden you can do in a school that's also aesthetic and we've developed the Mandala Garden. And you can see, I won't go through it, but the methodology of just um, uh, putting, no I won't go through it, but anyhow that's the stage next. Um, so in the SEED program, they build, first off, an outdoor classroom. We do too. There's a book downstairs on my and Robin's stall called um, A Portable Roundhouse Book, How to Get Up an Outdoor Classroom as well. That can be useful, and that's the SEED style of outdoor classroom. We work with African art, and this is a group of children who have designed a pattern, and that pattern has been um, in, in the garden seeds and seedlings laid out um, yeah, next. Um, so in the process of permaculture design we're then laying the model on the ground and working with staking out the model. Next. Um, the children are drawing up the model, scaling it, where it's basically you'll see in the next things. Next. Um, we're doing a whole permaculture design step by step, but with the children at different stages, with puppets with the young ones, stories and so on, right through to models and then maps, and we go through all of the same steps as we do with adults within the curriculum, within the classes. Next. You can see, it's familiar, but we're using simpler methods. Next. Next. So we're now with elements and guilds, and again, it's very interactive with the kids. It's a bit like a marketplace, you know, buying for position, but they know the principles and they know what they've observed. So they have some informed um, place to come to for deciding their final. Next. Um, with little kids, you can see we work, I have symbols that we work with, um, big ones and little ones, and we're putting the symbols down this is inside, rainy day, next. Um, on the school grounds, and also sheets, um, images, for example, you know, different types of garden beds, mandala gardens, different types of walkways that they can um, use as references to select from. Next. Um, yep, this is a few examples. Next. So I actually have pictures of other schools and other beds. Next. Some examples. Now they get into detailed design. Next. I'm just going to basically post it so you can learn from the images. And now we are outside instead of um, with the little kids. No, story next. <laughs> so we're just going to go through the pictures, actually. The title to tell you.
say about the Sutu, the school, Sunshine High School, they have, um, because they've got quite a lot of autonomy over their curriculum in some ways, they actually have permaculture as a subject and they examine it right through the school and the kids always get really high marks and it's pulled up the academic marks of every other subject bringing the monoculture design in at high school level. So I'll to say about that. So for example, the outdoor classroom. This is the portable roundhouse, which is a portable downstairs. This is what we build now in our schools for outdoor classroom. And the video. And I'm going to send, uh, send around the sign-up sheet if you're interested to know when the video comes out. And about it next. And the last one. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, it was almost like a, a video um, itself going so fast. I'm going to spend the next, how long have I got? Five, ten, uh, ten, 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 ten. About 12, 13 minutes. Okay. Can we have um, a start? But something light. I don't know. Is it open or something? Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. That's all right. Yeah, I want to just talk about the seed methodology and how it came to be. So I work more as an, a trained assistant school teacher and a primary school teacher, and then I've worked with in, um, more as an advisor to schools as an environmental educator in New Zealand. And then I went to South Africa and suddenly we are dropped into a situation where urgent, urgent crisis need is food, food in the school grounds. And so out of that um, story and history, I developed C, Schools, Environmental Education and Development. I'm not going to write it down. Schools, Environmental Education and Development. C has a website. It's really great. It's very common, um, which is www.seed.org. Uh, org.za. Um, so after working about nine months in um, Cape Fats out of Navalis Institute at Alina Besakaya and with Earthcare as a partner, um, we had done enough on the ground piloting and transference of the methodology that um, and putting in a place a, a, a young woman called Lee Brown, who's still the director of SEED now, and she's taken it and run with it. And that was my aim, to make myself redundant and actually just hand over. And of course it's been quite influenced, it's, been, it's a closer area and it's been influenced there by their culture as well. So I'm going to just talk about the different stages um, that has happened in the contemporary scene. They have something, phase one, called green beginnings. That's testing out, is the school really able to seriously take on the development of their school grounds into productive learning environments? SEED will come in as facilitators, and there's a, in terms of the New South Africa, there's a black-white mix, young-old mix of our facilitators, and they'll come in and they'll have several schools, one facilitator will have several schools, and they will support, they will be the teachers, and the teacher will stand in the background and learn, and that's when they start building their outdoor classroom and they get going on their lessons. The next stage is green production. So the first stage was green beginnings, green production. And that's when the school sets its own goals to develop further and that becomes teacher-led and seed-supported. And the third phase is green abundance. And this is where the school becomes a place and a source of employment, of different um, micro-enterprise initiatives. And like, for example, they've got one which is called the um, gourmet mushrooms. And they're producing gourmet mushrooms in a laboratory um, with the kids and with the um, local people giving employment and that's sold in supermarkets in Cape Town. And there's other sustainable livelihood cooperatives developing out of that school. So it's important, like with C, they have what's called Rockland's Abundance Centre. They have a master or a mother place, which is a permaculture demonstration and education place where those micro-enterprises happen. It's on a school grounds, and it's a total partnership with the community. I think I'd better leave it there, apart from to just zap around this if you're interested to sign up um, about the growing schools and just to say, remember to come forward to six tonight at Elizabeth Fry Room because I'm launching this growing schools documentary which is four parts, um, two hours long and it's awesome. 
Rebecca, Thank can you just um, um, make sure that's the right end to the website, good, yep. ZA? Mm -hmm. And what was the third one? Um, green Beginnings, Green... Green, um, green Beginnings, Green Abundance is the third, and Green Production is the second. So we're after transforming school grounds into a total productive learning environment, fully within the curriculum. And this, one of these documentaries is going to show you putting gardening at the heart of the curriculum. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for that um, speedy um, uh, talk. Fantastic. Someone at the back. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That was really interesting. I'm, I'm uh, wondering as you were talking about the outreach internationally, because one of the things I'm involved in leading up to the climate change talks is the project which is bringing schools together worldwide. And what we're trying to do is encourage them to submit really simple one minute videos and capture. And so the question I've got is what type of capture have you done with the descendants when you do it successfully? Okay. Could be perhaps replicated or taken Thank you. Can you just repeat the question? Um, I can just say, saying, um, what kind of capture have you done that's really succinct that you can feed into a global inspiration and a global picture of what's happening in schools now, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I didn't say something about seed. Seed is now, it's gone from the Cape Flat Squatter Settlement pilot, it's now national. So it's got six um, national nodes. It's totally endorsed by the South African government saying, how come you could do this and we can't even get our teachers motivated? Um, and it's got its own resource materials that's commissioned by the blah, blah, blah. blah. And so it's got still pays of time. So that national model, I reckon, um, probably you would need to make contact with those who are doing permaculture in schools and ask them to get that one minute video. Like in New Zealand, we've got a three minute trailer for our two hour documentary series in four parts. So it's a lot of material. But um, yeah, how to do it? Um, exactly like that. I think it needs to be self and shared. Give them time and um, ask you know, what you want to feature, what you want to really, um, a message you want to get, and then they'll speak to that message. Somebody else? Oh. Your question, please. Can I just clarify the room that the film is going to be in the center of the box? Is it going to be in the center? I'll let you know. Um, is there anything else? Because it was announced at the, d at the session today, at this morning session. Any so other questions? Someone's just asking where the film is tonight. George so Fox, you're right. Yes. It's George Fox. Right. Yeah. Um, George Fox. I have uh, another question. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, like, um, so I've trained as a teacher, but to be dissatisfied with the system, so not working on that at the moment. But I'm kind of interested in the difference between progressive and non-progressive well, individual education. And I'm wondering what the limits are that you've found in implementing it in schools, how realistic it is for the state system, both in primary and secondary. That's why the third document we've done is called Enriching Gardeners, Putting Gardeners at the Heart of the School Curriculum. We've got a lot of authority figures and kids, and it's just so convincing that if anyone's got questions, what a waste of time, maths and English, we haven't got time for this, they'll see actually you need to make time for this because maths and English for um, slow learners, for kids who are challenged, is absolutely essential for this kind of state of learning. So um, the, the conventional, it's to do with a champion in each school. If the head teacher or the head master or mistress is on board, you're one. But it's got to have a teacher or one person and preferably two. And we have, um, in the SEED program, we have a baseline for a school to enter the program. So it's 12 points that you need to tick. One of them is the caretaker on board with, the, with 12 points. Um, so that is the aspect of the um, the lead person or the champion, and then community engagement is essential. So um, the conventional is easy and alternative education. It just belongs naturally. But the key thing is, can the school be convinced that this is a very valid and valuable and academically plus part of their curriculum? If they can, you've got them. Yeah. Next question, please. Yeah. Yeah. Could you just repeat the question? Yeah. Have you partnered with other countries? So, in New Zealand, we have an organisation, Earth Care Education Aotearoa. We do um, a lot of different things in permaculture education, and mostly these days localising food. So, um, I've partnered. Our organisation is part with partnered with Fidesio Gaia in Brazil, 
and in Gadapaba and uh, whatever under the soul, um, even with the support of local authorities and Department of Education, we rolled out a whole training and there you have a full community integration now in the schools. And then we partnered with Abilene and um, Navas and Cape Town. And frankly, myself, um, I've kind of done that and now I'm totally focused on, on local food, localising food and documenting what's being done. So I'm not working so much in that, but partnering with other organisations is totally the way to go. And in our country, we have Enviro schools that the partnering is the way they go. And so I stand back and just say thank you because they're doing what I would otherwise be having respect to do. I'm guessing it might answer a question. I think two people ask the same thing. We didn't quite have the chance to, to give details, but it's an open question to the three of you, actually, mm -hmm. uh, to Robina um, and Robin, because uh, we we set out about three years ago to start this children network. And we especially uh, noticed that when you're talking about okay, permaculture, it's over. I was on teacher training, but nobody was really talking about children. Uh, and I met lovely people along the way, and they told me that there's a seed organization in South Africa and lovely things done in Australia in the outdoor classrooms. So the idea was not to reinvent the wheel, but bring people together all over the world, uh, let them share their experiences. And for that, we applied for Erasmus funding. It's not official yet. Uh, hopefully, we are getting the funding. And the idea is to create the website uh, and get educators, parents on board and just share the information and get these people connected. So, and that's like an open invitation, would you be willing to join? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Called? Children and Permaculture? You might write it. Yes. Yeah. So that's, okay. yeah. that's why we've done these documentary series, because it's actually in New Zealand, because there's so much happening, it's so exciting, it's so positive, and it's so transformative that it's really good to share it with examples of the world. Yeah, okay, we've that's got time for one more question. Yeah. What about the money? What about the money? Really good question. Okay. So me, I do heaps of voluntary work and I seem to balance my pay with the voluntary work. In New Zealand, um, Enviros, part of Enviro School's partnering is they have facilitators that are paid part, part by under the Enviro School's foundation money and half by the local council. That means the local council or the local authority, the municipality, under their environmental education part, needs to come on board financially as well. And they're hired <coughs> by the Enviro Schools Foundation. It's a really, really good model. And when I was working in South Africa, we got funding from the New Zealand High Commission, much easier in these two third um, global south countries. And then I split my money two ways with African people and my colleague did as well. So it's a matter of more um, being willing to maybe just get going by working for a bit less or working voluntary until it becomes something established and not being able to do without. And then um, it's applying for funding really. But the pressure should be put on the Department of Education um, and the school boards to actually financially support because this is about the future of our children and it's about financial support for the people who are bringing a much more prosperous and a healthy future and happy future for our kids. So keep that pressure on about the funding. Things like that. Thank you. Great. Thank Good you night. so much. <laughs> so as we're doing the changeover, if you can just turn to the person next to you or the people around you and just, just have a chat about what you've just learned from these two amazing presenters. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, this is the PowerPoint. Show me how to click the slide to slide. Okay. Yeah, we Okay. I sent it. Okay. 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 Are you, the, are you a techie person? Sorry? Are you a techie person? Techie person. Yeah. Um, I just here to, because I wanted to suggest that the reading some reference to people.
to check about the question. I'm just going to ask you. I just need to get Martin's stuff done. Just say that. slightly different age group here, and you may be wondering what the heck Future City Contest, which I wouldn't expect you to know what it is, has to do with permaculture. Um, in addition to my writing for kids, which mostly nonfiction books, which I love to do, um, I work, as you said, with my friend Ted Bonner at his company, which is Rubicon 7, and Rubicon 7 approaches sustainable development through technology, ecology, and sociology, so kind of function being and will. We try to bring more into it than just uh, the problem before us. So when I was a magazine editor, I was invited to this Future City contest as a judge because you know they, they want uh, visibility and they want to be want me to publish an article about them in one of our magazines. Uh, but when I got there and saw what these kids were doing, these are kids ages 12 to 14, I was just blown away that this group of kids, who tend to kind of get lost in the shuffle a little bit, they aren't, you know, they aren't the little kids who, who need a lot of hands-on help, and they aren't the teenagers in high school who are really moving into adult arenas. They're, they're stuck in the middle, they're tweens, if you want to call them that. And the Future City competition, which I'll explain in more detail in a minute, captures these kids. And Ted was a, a judge, you know, Ted and I were both judges. And we're walking through their displays and looking at what they're doing, thinking, this is amazing. These kids are having amazing ideas. 
and so many of them are permaculture and they don't even know it. And I'm thinking, why can't we get permaculture into this contest? But at the core of Future Cities, which is about 23 years old, uh, they have been addressing the problems in cities, and this is getting to be a huge, huge issue because you may or may not be aware, but increasingly the demographic in the world is people moving to urban areas. They're leaving the rural behind every year. Um, this particular chart shows you in America that population losses, and you can see that in the middle of the country, we're losing population and they're moving to the coast and moving to the cities. Um, they call it the hollowing out of America in that they can't support themselves with agriculture, there isn't enough industry, the small towns are drying up and going away. Uh, and here you see the big, the purple blotches are the big urban centers in the United States. And basically it's one giant city from where I live in New Hampshire all the way down the East Coast. That's our future, that is what's happening. So future city is, is looking at, it already had this in mind. Here's another example of, of what our world is going to look like in 2025 with these big cities as the rural population goes down and the ur urban population goes up. Um, it's, it's an amazing shift. I like this chart because it really puts it out there. By 2050, seven out of every 10 people will live in an urban area. That's pretty amazing, and especially when you think that these cities are absorbing all of these people, but they don't always have, or they usually don't have, the infrastructure to handle them. What are we going to do as these cities get bigger and bigger, and how are they going to survive? And here's an example. These are pictures of uh, <coughs> rural America, <coughs> where uh, factories are silent and farms are falling apart, main streets are derelict. Some of that is thanks to things like Walmart and other big stores that pull the business away, but that's another topic. <laughs> and we're going to end up more with these huge cities that are just sprawling and growing, and many things need to be addressed. So I was invited to go to Future City, and I'm like, I don't really know what this is. So we went to Washington, D.C. for the Nationals, and from the minute you walk in, you can tell this is a big deal. It's not. It's not homegrown, it's not grassroots. These, uh, this competition is supported by um, some pretty big companies, and granted they have their agendas, which I am perfectly aware of. Uh, but this, this contest was started by engineers to promote the field of engineering. Um, I assume everybody knows what STEM is, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Those are the four big pieces of um, education that, especially in the U.S., are really being pushed right now, that we need kids to be really good at STEM topics and, and have careers in STEM. So Future City um, was started for engineering. It works really well as a contest because it's very diverse. I mean, you, you, it's, as usual, you have local contests and they advance to the regionals and they advance to the nationals. But it doesn't matter whether or not a school is wealthy, where the kids come from, gender, race, anything, because there's a limit of $100 for what they can spend to create their models of the city. Um, they can come from anywhere. If they advance to the nationals, everything is paid for, so they don't have to have bake sales to get to <laughs> Washington, D.C. <coughs> so that and making industry partnerships for the benefit of kids and that, you know, it's nice to have that influence of cash. Sometimes I was a little uncomfortable, like Mr. Shell, I can't remember what he, he's like a vice president, standing up there, and I'm, I'm just wasn't sure that, that he was really the right person to be standing up there in front of these kids, but at any rate. Um, so what these kids have to do is they are designing a city at least 100 years in the future, and they are given a set of guidelines and there are five things that they have to do. Uh, they have to design the city using um, Sim software, Sim City, the game. Uh, they have to um, make a presentation to the judges, and some of them were so creative, they're dressed up, and they're, you know, they're, it was like watching the play. Um, they have to create an actual physical model of their city only from recycled materials, and as I said, there's a $100 limit to what they can spend. They have to write an essay, 
and new this year they have to do like a project management piece like how they will approach the whole contest and all the components because they want them to understand how you do a big engineering project and so they start it starts with about um, 1350 schools and then 37 regions the China came this year and I guess it's going to expand next year to include um, the United Kingdom and then they go to the nationals and there are <coughs> a total of 40,000 kids all over the country and the few foreign countries that participate in this 12 14 years old um, they do it every year they have to have you know mentors and adults to help them sometimes they're affiliated with a school sometimes not so here we are at the, the finals, and this is a big deal, a very visible thing, because in these final judges, we have a White House nutrition advisor, we have an engineer from Bechtel, uh, we have a woman who's been president of the Engineering Society, we've just got uh, somebody who writes for Fast Company, we're just big name people. So it's getting the contest out there in front of people just by virtue of who's involved. And part of the component, and this is where I really started to think permaculture, of each year's uh, contest is there is a theme. And last year it was feeding future cities. They had to come up <coughs> with a plan for feeding their entire population on, I think it was one protein crop and one um, other crop, I can't remember what it was particularly, uh, for a certain amount of time. So that was their problem to figure out. In the past, they've had to deal with stormwater or green energy. This year's theme is waste to not want not. So future city sees, sees what's coming, sees what's happening with this move to being urban and the kind of problems that we want these kids to start thinking about how to deal with because they're going to be there. Now, I don't know how many of you have spent a lot of time with 12 to 14 year olds. Um, I taught them for a year and I survived. <laughs> uh, but actually, I am very fond of them because they are all energy and they have great ideas and they aren't quite so constrained by, you know, peer pressure yet. Uh, when we walked into the hotel in Washington, D.C. for the contest, in the lobby of the hotel, there were 1,000 middle school kids just it was like parting the seas to get through them, and it was, <laughs> was like an amazing experience <laughs> to be with that many kids of that age. But it was it was electrifying. It was really great. So here's just a few of the things that that are characteristic of that age group. You know, they can be all over the place in their intellectual development. They're curious. They like to learn with their friends. They like to solve problems. They're independent. And they like to argue. Um, they're not as concerned with their goals as they are with their social and personal goals and, their, and those concerns drive them for the large part and they are facing decisions that could impact them for the rest of their lives especially academically so they've got a lot of baggage but they're not weighed down by it as much yet so here's just an example of some of the um, models of their cities that they built and this is all recycled stuff but we've got um, these are our towers of uh, they grow crops and they rotate to get the maximum sun. So that was one idea. Um, this particular presentation, they had this lily pad out in the ocean for some of their people to live on, and, and they were making energy with waves hitting these. Mm -hmm. But it was just, you know, we're, we're talking 40 of these in a, in a room, and you're walking, the kids are giving you a presentation, and it's just, it's really amazing. And Stacking function. Future City does this really, really well. There are so many things they are doing with this contest. They're helping the kids be better at public speaking. They're, um, you know, showing them how to use their resources well. They're putting forth the STEM curriculum. They're, they're all these things that Future City is accomplishing without having any idea what permaculture is. I mean, none at all. So. The question is, though, you know, I, I think there's a big piece of future city that could benefit from an influx of permaculture thinking. And ideally, I would love to see this kind of a contest run just with permaculture, but I think that would take a, a, a long time to get established, because this has been going for almost 25 years. But 
one of my problems with it is, is as we know, engineers tend to want to build a solution, so it's very resource intensive. You know, let's put up this new whatever it is to handle the problem of wastewater, or let's you know build um, vertical farms and things like that. They don't really have an idea yet of how to create an eco city, a city that's a little bit or a lot more self-sustaining. They don't know how to make it regenerative. But they're kind of moving that way with, their, with establishing the themes and things they want to deal with. So I guess what struck me is that there were many things they were having the kids do that were basically permaculture, that the kids were having to discover those things for themselves. Whereas if there were a permaculture component to this contest, they would start with some of the knowledge there. They would start with the principles. They would, they would have that to build with when they're building their city. Permaculturists are also working at creating eco-cities. Um, we don't generally work within institutional frameworks, which is, I think, something we could learn to a degree from future city. I mean, obviously, we're not going to go make partnerships with some of these big corporations, especially those ones that have ethics that bother us. But the fact that Future City has figured out how to make these, these partnerships makes them more visible, gets them out there, makes their uh, mission um, easier for people to see. Uh, so integrated design and collaboration is something that could be done between permaculturists and these engineers, especially in Future City. But we have to have solid research because these STEM people are all about science and research. And I don't know if anybody remembers uh, two years ago in Cuba when uh, Raptor Ferguson did a talk on whether permaculture was science or pseudoscience. So he was kind of touching on that need for solidly grounding permaculture in science, which would be necessary for this. So basically, Future City is very successful because they're not only developing kids and helping them not only learn these STEM career ideas, but also developing themselves, this age group that, you know, is ripe for that kind of thing, not yet on the um, career track of, of high schoolers. But they also see what's coming in the urbanization and the need for mm -hmm. more sustainable cities, you know, how this is going to have to work. And they also know how to create partnerships that make them more visible and make it easier for more kids to participate because there's that uh, financial help. And, but our strength is regeneration. And our pace in permaculture is a little slow. We like to do things slow and steady and the pace of cities is much faster and more manic. But future cities can learn from us about regeneration and you know all the different things that we can use to help make um, the city of the future more viable and more sustainable. And there we go. Those are the kids who are going to be designing our cities. And uh, <laughs> I was so impressed with them. It, it was an amazing experience that I didn't expect to be what it was. And I just, I just love these kids. And I think, let's teach them permaculture and they can do whatever they want and save the world. <laughs> <laughs> I have two reference slides, so. Thanks. Thank you so much, Marcia, for that introduction to Future City. This is a, a fantastic model. Um, we'll take questions. Just a question. Has this presentation been collected and available somewhere? Does anyone know the answer? Is this <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, but they're all being recorded. Um, so that somebody will have them somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I really need to give it away. Hmm? I really need to give it away this whole presentation. Yeah. Yeah. And and anybody okay. who wants uh, wants me to send it to them, just uh, I'll give you my email. I will ask uh, Andy uh, to say something later to make you want about that question. So that's a really yeah, important sure point. What's going to be available afterwards? Why do they care, those big companies and those high-powered people? Why are they doing this? Because 
they desperately need um, people in the STEM field. So they're basically seeding their future work uh, force because there, is, there just aren't enough kids who are coming out of high school right now with, with strong science and technology backgrounds in the United States. So this works well for them, especially. And I like the fact that they're they're also very supportive of girls being engineers. But they they want to bring up this crop of people because otherwise they're going to be in big trouble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Always. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. So I think that's true in this country. I started doing engineering instead of A-levels, but I'm the only girl and it's horrible. Mm -hmm. So I stopped doing it. <laughs> Anyone else has a question? Yeah, how can you suppose enroll and how can you do this program? Um, there's a website, it's just futurecity.org, and they tell you everything you need to know to get your own, uh, for lack of a better word, chapter started. And they lay it all out. There's no restrictions. They don't care where you're from. You have to have a certain number of kids and people to supervise them and, and you know, move the process along. But uh, it's very egalitarian. You know, it, and that's what I like. There's so little financial outlay that any any school can do it. Uh, so, yeah, um, I see this American and the UK and China, but. I mean, all the things that, that this, um, this future city is providing, mm -hmm. um, and it seems that there's not a lot of expense, right. just there's a cap. So, wouldn't it, I mean, do you see uh, any disadvantages, for example, of, for example, like recycling? So, if they can set it up there, but just using our local industries, so mm -hmm. local, uh, you know, uh, engineering companies and that kind of thing. But, but are there any disadvantages or any major advantages to this massive? I mean, is it because the kids get a sense of authority because it's a big company that they recognize that Shell, the CEO is there? Or you think that's not really a loss? I don't think kids care about that at yeah. this point. I think they're more into, I mean, kids like competition, for one mm. thing. But there's so many facets of this that are fascinating for them that I, I don't think they really notice other than maybe the fact that if they go to the regionals or the nationals, they go to the But, um, and the, the kids from China had um, a great presentation and and um, they were right up on par with everyone else who had been living a lot longer. So I definitely see this as something that would mm -hmm. expand all over the globe, and I think that's what they're hoping for. Mm -hmm. um, from what you observed of the uh, entries to this competition, you know, where were the, um, the biological Models. We were the biological solutions rather than the hard tech. It was there a, a, a range? Mostly what I saw, because this one was um, focusing on food, were very creative ways to put food growing spaces in the middle of the city. Now, some of them were vertical, some of them were, I <laughs> think there was one that was underground. Um, there, as I showed the, the picture, there were the big revolving um, kind of like versions of a vertical farm, but very creative, and it had to be within the city. So, and um, as we know, one of the reasons that cities are not economically, or not sustainable is because they have to bring in all their food. So, they did it, you know, the kids just did all kinds of things to get that food going right in the middle of the city. And even if they had to put their housing underground or something like that, they found a way to do it. And it was really, really interesting.
collect that thing. Well, I think people will go to lunch. But I have another suggestion that's here and now. Can I put it? Yep, yep. Um, that list that's going around, the sign up sheet, where is it, please? Sign up sheet that's moving. Yeah. Keep it moving. I'm um, even put it on the back, which is another page. Of, and we could use that for the schools, the African school, if you, if you don't mind, but you know, if you do, um, I can send that out and you can link with that list put that invitation out for other teachers here to get back. So just to recap, there's a uh, paper going around where you can write your details and that will be, uh, people will be invited to get in touch. Yeah, I will send it out and, say, and you'll give me your details as well and I'll say, please get in touch about connecting with the African schools. Fantastic, that sounds brilliant, great. Right, we've got time for one more question. Yes, sir. In India, we have been trying to do garden in the school and uh, link various curriculum items to that garden. How you can learn mathematics through garden, how you can learn measurement through garden, how you can learn security through garden. So, is there any experience of that kind that we have learned? Um, at this level with these kids, it's all, um, there's very little hands-on, I guess I would say. It's, it's all, you know, the, the simulations and building the model and, and thinking through the problems. Uh, but again, I think that if you started at the local level, the local schools, before they proceed through the contest, that would be a great time to do a unit learning about permaculture and doing a little hands-on work because I think they're going to design better if they have to at least, you know, try planning on paper or get out there and try something, I think any time, they're still young enough where hands-on stuff helps with the whole process. So I, I think that would be a terrific addition. Thank you. Um, Thank you. If it's really quick, in the project of the future, uh, city have to analyze it, that is how many percent of the children understand the full system of the uh, I'm sorry, you have to slow down. Um, I see that in the conversation, it will be many, many complaints guys by the people in Red Mills. How many percent in the, the children right now in that project understand in the future? Just asking how many people doing this project actually understand that? I would be surprised if any of them did. Because the big, you know, big corporations, don't. I, I would say for the most part they have no idea. So it doesn't filter down through the curriculum and the contest guidelines, which again is why I think this is tailor made for us to find a way to get into. Sounds like it, that a pound coach would give children an edge. It would, <laughs> and we, it would start them ahead of where they have to start. You're going to have to start. Sorry, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to have to stop because it's not just time for me to But please do say. Uh, can I, can I, I really think I'll need to put it down here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Robin's table and Davina's table downstairs. And uh, here, oh, sorry. Thank, thank you very much. We've just explored how we can support children to design the world they want. I think we've had three fabulous speakers. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we have to end that. <laughs> Uh, may I just suggest, if anyone's hungry, go to lunch, and if anyone's interested in continuing this conversation, we can maybe have a little circle and uh, share some ideas about this. Can I say, can please have lunch and eat and talk together? Um, we can eat food in this room and talk about permaculture and education. Here's, here's my business card.